board member Jack, my friend and fellow board member Jacqueline Schwartz, whose picture you see up there, uh, traveled to Israel as Canadian participants in an American Friends of Peace Now study tour. This evening, Jacqueline and I are going to share some of our observations from that tour. And Juliana decided she didn't really want to share any of hers because even though she was a very active participant, she's not on the board of Canadian Friends of Peace now and just felt, ah, I'd rather let you guys do it. So getting started, I, I want to give you a little bit of a preamble. Nobody has ever accused me of being a scholar. Nobody has ever suggested that I am an expert on the Middle East or that I have some special expertise. I read about it all the time. I've been reading about it for years, going to lectures, uh, been to Israel a couple of times before this, and uh, webinars of late in large numbers, but still I wouldn't call myself an expert. So I'm not gonna try and tell you what the truth is. What I'm gonna tell you is, Here's what I saw, and here's what surprised me, and here's what impressed me. And you can decide for yourself if you agree with things that I say. And to some extent, I'm going to try to illustrate. Um, I'm going to have a little trouble with pictures because uh, technically I didn't prepare the pictures properly, but I think we can make them work anyway. Jacqueline, do you want to come in? Um, yes. Well, uh, shall I start or, well, I, I will say same here. I, um, even though I, I read and see too many webinars and have done for a long time and have been on the board for a long time, um, I'm, I'm not uh, an academic uh, expert on this conflict. However, uh, seeing it in going to the occupied territories was a real eye opener and really kind of brings a lot of what I've been reading and seeing brings it home. So, uh, so this is this is where we landed. Right. Uh, and what's interesting here is that we spent almost all of our time in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Uh, we spent a little bit of time in Tel Aviv, a little bit of time in the Old City and uh, practically no time in the West Jerusalem. That's uh, right. And I just want to interject that we know that a lot of you have been to Israel, like probably many times. So um, we're not covering that. The reason I think for this, uh, this talk is to talk about the occupied territories where people can't go and don't go. Yeah. And so we checked in at an absolutely wonderful hotel called the American Colony Hotel, which uh, is now immediately my favorite hotel in the whole world. Right. And uh, can people see the picture there? Is the screen share working? Yeah, it says it's working. Can you see a picture, Jacqueline? Yes, I can. And good, I good, good. So uh, go ahead. This is a large hotel in East Jerusalem. It's absolutely beautiful, even though it's about 100 years old, well-maintained. And what we didn't know when we checked in, but found out very quickly, we're about 100 meters away from the Sheikh Jarrah um, area, which, as I think everybody knows, is uh, the scene of a, an eviction conflict where Palestinians are being evicted from homes in which they lived before the 1967 war. Uh, and this is a constant battle in the Supreme Court, which of course, if the judicial reforms get through, will be lost immediately. Yes, and uh, I believe that Peace Now has been demonstrating there uh, weekly. Yes. Sh Shalom Akshav uh, has been demonstrating there weekly. Uh, I'd also, uh, add that uh, um, Ben Gavir set up his kind of mock office there for a while when he was running for office. He had a card table and a chair and a sign. Disgusting person. Um, so 
The day we landed in Israel, after we had checked into the hotel, I learned that there had been a pogrom, pogrom uh, the day before. We came a day early, and when I picked up the newspapers, lo and behold, we learned about uh, the village of Hawara, which is a Palestinian village in the West Bank, and uh, there had actually been a pogrom there. So uh, I, I had trouble believing it, except that all the Israeli newspapers covered it, and for a brief moment, it was the main news. Right, meaning meaning the West Bank was yeah. in the news, which yeah, is it, always. <laughs> well, it was even more important for a brief moment than the uh, than the judicial reform protests or the Sheikh Jarrah protests. Right. Um, now, the first day, the first official day, we were taken to a Palestinian village called Al Wajala. Al Walaja, sorry, right. pronounced a little bit better, I hope. Al Walaja is in East Jerusalem. And so I was a bit surprised when we got on a bus from our hotel in East Jerusalem, which is in the dead center of East Jerusalem, uh, about um, a kilometer from the old city. And as I said, uh, the site of quite a bit of activity. And they told us it was going to take an hour to get to this East Jerusalem village. Couldn't figure this out. Turned out that this is a very complicated fact that it's East Jerusalem. And what happens is that this village is partly in area A and partly in area B. It is partly uh, with inside the separation wall, partly outside the separation wall, and they do not have any municipal services at all, even though they're part of East Jerusalem. But the people who live there are permanent residents of East Jerusalem. Uh, they own their own homes where they, own, where they are homeowners and no contest about them owning their homes because they own these homes prior to the 1967 war. So, and the land, no, they own the land that the homes are on. Yeah. And so what they are trying to do is to create a functional village and update it as need be. And as people have children and the children want a house, they want to build a house. And I think that makes pretty good sense. Except in order to build or expand a house, you need a building permit. And whenever they applied for building permits, they were turned down on grounds that uh, there was some technical failure in their building permit. And just over and over, they would apply and they'd be turned down. And finally, they'd get frustrated and they'd build without a permit. And the place might stand for a year or so. And then the army would come in, the Israeli Defense Force, and tear down the building with bulldozers. And it was just unbelievable. So I'm going to try share our screen again and show you a picture of um, of a demolished home. And this is, uh, well, you can see I, I got stuck in this picture and my wife, Juliana, is here. Jim Klesnick, who is the uh, president of Americans for Peace Now and uh, a couple of other tourists. And what you see behind you, though, is very interesting. That's rebar. That's metal that was used to reinforce the concrete when they built this addition to their home. And uh, it was when they destroyed it, the rebar is still sticking out. And what you see here is a mess. Uh, people have just been left with a slab of concrete where they thought they had an addition to their home. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the only home we saw that had been de demolished. Uh, but I think there is some, in a way there's hope on the horizon because they're very lucky uh, to have um, a group from uh, Ir, Ir Amin, the Jerusalem group, 
uh, I think it's Danny Seidemann's group, um, helping them to get permits and yeah. make a plan because that mm -hmm. is what is lacking. So this will be like uh, a uh, sort of foolproof ironclad you know, plan uh, so that no one can say no. Of course, that was before um, this new government. Well, we did meet some of the people uh, in the village. And uh, here are two of the Palestinian villagers and a woman who is working on the ironclad plan that Jacqueline just mentioned. We met two women and a town planner and an architect who have been working with these Palestinian gentlemen and hoping, as Jacqueline said, to develop an ironclad plan that nobody can undermine. I mean, uh, not everybody has such such help. They're, they're very lucky. However, uh, I, I want to just add something. Afterwards, we had a very nice al fresco lunch outdoors at the usual long table and the usual uh, Middle Eastern salad and the usual <laughs> rice and chicken dish. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was all very pleasant. And then recently we heard some news, Bob. Yeah, uh, we got an email that the restaurant, now I should explain this restaurant, the owner was smart. He knew not to uh, build a brick and mortar restaurant because he knew that the military would just come in and tear it down if he did. So he built a tent, sort of a canopy tent that was open air. And then he put in some really nice furniture. And so you could sit on a nice chair around a nice table, a uh, great long table, and uh, you were in a real restaurant and they served great food. Uh, and then the military came to tear it down and there was a problem. How do you tear down a tent? because before they came, he had folded up the tent and there was no tent to tear down. So guess what they did? They demolished the furniture. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to add one, one or two quick things about this, the people who live there. There have been absolutely no terrorist accusations about any of the villagers. These people are peaceful, and nobody has suggested that there's uh, that they're doing something harmful when they build their houses an hour away from the center of East Jerusalem or an hour away from the old city. And they are still being frustrated. And as we left, they were pleading with us. And I mean pleading with us, tell the people back in the United States and Canada what's happening. Make sure they understand what's happening to us. And that's one of the reasons that we're doing this tonight. Right. Uh, final note on this. Amenu in the United States is uh, collecting money to send to the village to help them in their fight in court and in the zoning. And uh, anybody who contributes money to Amenu will probably not get a tax receipt because it's an American organization, but I still fe felt it was worth it and so contributed. Right. And uh, with any luck, we can win. And, and uh, oh, one last thing. Anybody who ever wants to visit will be surprised because most of the checkpoints you pass when you go into the West Bank are people with machine guns. This one, you just, they're all asleep. You just drive by because the people are peaceful. <laughs> no problems come out of there. Jacqueline, do you want to go on? Yes, um, I'm going to talk about uh, Hebron. Our guide uh, on the bus and our educator was uh, a young man called Ben Bensi Sanders. He is from Breaking the Silence, and we've had other people talk to us about Breaking the Silence, and I think there was even a video. Um, so. Breaking the Silence, in case you don't know, was formed by Israeli military veterans who really want to stop uh, the intimidation of uh, Palestinian residents. And like others, he did not think that his training uh, and dedication and his uh, elevation to the special forces would lead to uh, manning roadblocks, intimidating Palestinians, 
just to show them who was boss, who was in control. And in Hebron, uh, it's home to 200,000 residents. Uh, it's the only Palestinian city with an Israeli settlement at the heart of it. The formerly bustling center, city center, now has street after street of Palestinian owned boarded up shops, storefronts. Uh, they're not allowed to operate and, um, and they call this uh, a sterile, a sterile street. Um, as the most like, well, anyway, as you know, um, Baruch Goldstein massacred, I think it was 29 Palestinians in a mosque and um, he's, he's celebrated. He like Kahane, who is um, um, the role model of Ben Gavir is, uh, is celebrated. We saw his grave, we went to his grave, which is visited by a lot of settlers. There, there he is, there's uh, Ben Svi. And in his grave, uh, it's on his gravestone, it says, uh, um, may his blood be avenged. Um, you got so this point, I, I want to admit that I chickened out on something. Uh, I really had hoped when I went to Hebron to pee on his grave. But there were people around and I just felt that it would look bad. And besides, there might be soldiers come. And so I missed my opportunity and I was really regretful afterwards. <laughs> So Yigal Amir, the assassin of Rabin, uh, spoke of Goldstein as his role model. And um, anyway, there are some 200,000 citizens of, uh, well, I don't know, not citizens, people of Hebron and only 800 are, are Jews. Um, also in the Hebron Hills is a place that's getting some attention called Masa Feriata. Um, which was declared uh, a firing zone. There are a lot of firing zones. If you look at a map on the on the periphery of the West Bank, so uh, Palestinians living in these villages, not a lot of people, but they were there and uh, were were ordered to evacuate, and their homes were demolished. We heard in translation. Uh, from American volunteers speaking for a woman named Kifa Haladara. And she served us lunch at, again at a long table and said that, you know, people who visit make us feel supported. We had no idea uh, how these young women from the United States got there. But uh, anyway, uh, and she complained, this woman, uh, about not having electricity or proper electricity. And somebody in our group said, well, why don't you get solar panels? And she said, we did, but they took them off. So it's that kind of um, constant hassling, verging on sadism. Uh, the good news, the little spark of good news there was uh, people are building a school and because schools have been demolished. So they're, they're building a school. Um, like much of the land that we saw in the West Bank, this was very sparse. That we were, we were, we noticed uh, how how few people were there, and it was hilly and and rocky. Um, we, I don't know, I didn't expect that, but maybe I didn't know what to expect. So I went up the hill, and a woman greeted me, and she had a tiny grocery store, and it was sad to see because it was mostly canned food. And especially sad was the canned olives, you know, in this land of olives. But she was cheerful and her teenage daughter and a friend spoke of a bit of English and she had a lot of goats, which graze. Um, Bob, I could go to- uh, Just before you leave that, I wanted to mention that the woman Jacqueline is describing was the impetus behind developing the schools in that town. And she one day said, this is ridiculous. Our kids take a long bus ride to go to school. By the time they're ready for high school, they don't wanna to go to school anymore. We're going to build a school. And 
somehow or another, this woman's tenacity actually worked and they built first grade, then second grade, and they finished now up to grade eight and they're working on building a high school and uh, the attendance at school is much better and the kids are learning much more rapidly. And uh, I was really impressed to meet this woman. Wow. We only hope that the school will be demolished. Yeah. Well, she's, she's somehow been able to get permits to build them. I think they're embarrassed to tear down schools too often. Um, next stop, the Palestinian city of Ramallah, which is the capital, really. Uh, it's hard to figure out. Parts of it are shabby, not a place, certainly not a place tourists would want to visit. Other parts are more upscale, like high rise apartment buildings that look good and restaurants. We went to a really good restaurant. Um, and across from the restaurant, I checked out a grocery store, which was small and well run and with a lot of familiar brands. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's surprising that it also, um, as I kept thinking, shows you what could be, what could be, just like East Jerusalem with the American Colony Hotel, which has been called an oasis. And with the, so with the restaurants in the area uh, could be all normal. So in Ramallah, we met uh, again, another boardroom. We, we met the noted, the pollster, uh, Professor Khalil Shikaki, director of the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research. So what really struck me was what he said about how young Palestinians are turning away from religion and toward violence. This is fueled in part by the refusal to hold elections by Mahmoud Abbas, the 87 year old president from the Palestinian Authority. Um, Shikaki does his polls uh, in a very um, sort of foolproof way. Well, he ask, he'll ask the same question a couple of times. So his answers are, are solid. So he said that at least 85% uh, of Palestinians think the Palestinian Authority is corrupt. And um, it, okay, among 18, to, here are some statistics, among 18 to 22 year olds, only 20% are religious while the number rises to 58% among their parents and grandparents. And as he said, these are secular kids, the most liberal when it comes to religion and the most discontent. They are angry and not just about economic issues. There is declining support, he says, for a two-state solution. 30 years ago, it was 80%. Now 21% of youths only support a two-state solution and only 36% of their parents. And along with this, he links this really to the support to hopelessness and the support for violence. Um, kids, he says, increasingly support armed groups. The PA, Palestinian Authority, has no legitimacy in preventing or power really to prevent violence. And why violence? The kids are saying, well, it's the most effective way to end the occupation. So lack of trust is increasing uh, along with its support for violence. And what can change this? He says, well, elections, adding that um, there's always Hamas uh, in Gaza, but he said, there's no way they can win according to their, his data. Um, so that used to be, I think, more of a threat. Um, Anyway, when asked, why are kids becoming more militant? He said, mostly because Israel is building more and more settlements. Yep. Uh, I want to mention two, two things about uh, Shikaki, who is absolutely brilliant. And he has a website 
that reports all of his survey findings. So people can go on his website if you're interested. And he has a technique for asking questions where he can uh, change the answers in terms of percentages uh, to get possible solutions as opposed to immediate ones. So for example, he will say, are you in favor of a two-state solution? And as Jacqueline said, the numbers have been dropping constantly for the past 30 years, uh, 25 years, whatever it is. Then he changes the question, says, are you in favor of a two-state solution if the two states are equal? Uh -huh. And right. the numbers go up. Or he says, are you in favor of a two-state solution in which there is no corruption in the PA? And the numbers go up. Now, of course, the two-state solution has nothing to do with corruption. Uh, but the the point he's making is there is more potential for a two-state solution than these numbers suggest, uh, providing that the Palestinians feel they're getting a fair deal. Uh, the other thing I recommend most highly, go on the Americans for Peace Now website, and they have a, a really great webinar with Camille Shikaki, in which he explains very clearly uh, what Jacqueline couldn't say, and he spends an hour telling what Jacqueline summarized in five minutes. Really worth watching. Um, also in Ramallah, we had a meeting with the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, <laughs> Mohammed Shtatia, who was a very, uh, I think, impressive looking diplomat. And um, we, I asked him, what would the conditions be for having elections? And he's, he mentioned Israel and, and Jerusalem and giving them citizenship, which you know, East Jerusalem people don't have. They, it, has, it has long been said that they didn't want citizenship uh, because that would mean collaborating with the Jews, the Israelis, but that's not true of everyone. And for instance, I talked to the sort of semi-famous guy who runs the bookstore in the wonderful American Colony Hotel. And he was telling me, he's by the way, a graduate of Essex University in the UK. And he was telling me what you know other people have told us that he's been trying to for years to get citizenship uh, because for one thing, uh, he can, means he can travel. Now, if he does like a doctorate at Cambridge and spends a couple of years, there's no guaranteeing that he'll be allowed back into Israel. But anyway, it's a long process. It doesn't always work. And it costs thousands of dollars in legal fees. Yeah. I, I want to mention a couple more things. Uh, we met a woman in East, East Jerusalem. Now, actually, she joined us for dinner in East Jerusalem. She's not from East Jerusalem. She's from the West Bank, which meant that she has to go through uh, checkpoints to get in and to get out. And this is a woman in her 20s, drop dead good looking. Right. No uh, scarf. Yeah. And uh, very dynamic speaker. Apparently, she's called to do public speaking fairly often. And her name is Yara Amaira. And she is with an organization that translates as Land for All. And she is a very strong advocate of uh, either a one state or a two state solution, she doesn't care, in which everybody is treated equally. And she has more ideas on how to get there than uh, just about anybody I met. And when somebody asked her about violence, she said, we'd never win. That's that's not a good solution. We've got to get there some other way. Um, I just want to say something about where we met, where she spoke to us. It was at this very cool restaurant walking distance from the American Colony Hotel uh, called Cloves run by a Palestinian chef named, um, I'm sorry, I can't find it now. But anyway, he he was uh, 
<laughs> um, a finalist in Top Chef Middle East and did a stage in France. And I taught, he wasn't there, but his friend and head waiter was there. And this is the kind of cool restaurant that you find in you know, major cities, like no white tablecloths, but really excellent inventive food. And here it is, it's in East Jerusalem, you know, where today uh, yeshiva bachers were throwing, you know, beating up Palestinians. Um, so to me, again, the hotel, the, the restaurants we went to that were all Palestinian in East Jerusalem, to me, it is, uh, it's a vision of normalcy. And of potential. Yes. Uh, just quickly want to jump in for those of you who are interested in Shalom Mashav, Peace Now in Israel. Uh, going to show you a picture of a tour we got. If I can, uh, if I can get this working properly. Um, and okay, I will. This is uh, Lior, who is the CEO of Amer of Peace Now of Shalom Shab, and he gave us a tour of East Jerusalem. That's his map there. And in the background, you can see my wife, Juliana, who is uh, always cleverly coming up with something. And uh, turns out Lior has gone to the University of London, where Juliana also did an undergraduate degree. So she asked him rather quietly, is Jeremy Bentham still there? <laughs> and he took a double take and said, yes. <laughs> so thought he had a great sense of humor. Okay. Um, the next thing, I just want to show a picture of something that uh, doesn't need to be discussed in any depth, but I think people would be interested in um, this one. This is the grave of Yasser Arafat. Right. Uh, and there's a museum for Yasser Arafat. So if anybody thinks he is out of the picture, no, he's not. He is very celebrated. People come to the museum and they note his graveside. And it is a protected area, as you can see, with two Palestinian uh, police officers. Uh, I wanted to. We wanted to. I wanted to see the museum, but there wasn't time. Uh, but I can just tell you that it just looks like you know a very modern, uh, well-designed museum, with a pavilion on the outside. Um. I've got a note here, can the websites mentioned be shared? And if anybody will send me an email, care of uh, Canadian Friends of Peace Now, I will send you either website information or maps. I have a map that just won't show up on a screen and I'll be more than pleased to, uh, to send them out. Just ask for anything and I'll get them out to you within a few days. Right. And there's another, question here. Uh, what else did the Palestinian Prime Minister have to say? And uh, I'm afraid that's a difficult one. Well, he said that um, because I, I took compulsive notes throughout this whole trip. Uh, he said that um, there was great hope with Rabin. And when Rabin was assassinated, that was the death of hope, but not totally, but he had great faith in Rabin. He had great faith in Oslo. Um, was, did he, was he the one who talked about, no, he wasn't about the money, the, um, the funds that support uh, the Palestinian Authority from Israel? Uh, when we were there, I think it was, uh, yeah, the pollster who said that, um, I think it was 
was him, who said that um, there was a teacher's strike because they haven't gotten a raise in ages. So kids weren't going to school. So here you have like, especially young men not going to school and not working probably. So it's, it's a recipe for, for violence. I, um, I would subtract one thing. I don't think I got very many good answers or understandable answers from the prime minister. Uh, it wasn't I, a question though. This was something he volunteered. Yes, he no, he he did volunteer very uh, quite a number of interesting things, but when people asked him what would be necessary for peace, yeah, I, I never really him. understood his answer. He said it, it had to do with Jerusalem. Yeah. <laughs> so the onus was on um, Israel to do something. Yeah. Would you like to say a word about um, Michael Sfard? Yes, I would, and I'd like to show you his picture. Even though many of us have seen his seen his uh, picture because he's done webinars for us at Canadian Friends of Peace now, this is a lawyer who is somehow or another in the midst of every battle uh, for human rights, for constitutional rights, and for Palestinian home demolitions, and he is sort of the lawyer of choice. Uh, when Jacqueline mentioned the school, the woman who is building the school, he was the lawyer who managed to prevent the school from being demolished. Yeah. And uh, he is routinely retained by Shalom Mashav. He's practically Shalom Mashav's in-house lawyer, although he does take other cases. And uh, he explained to us the judicial reform in quite a bit of detail. Uh, much more detail than I want to go into now. And this was at a time when the demonstrations were building up. They were really big, but not nearly as big as they became. And uh, so we asked him, are you optimistic? Do you think that anything will happen? Now, this was about the judicial reform, not about the two state. And he said, you know, if you'd asked me that two months ago, I'd have said no. If you'd asked me that a month ago, I'd say not very. If you asked me two weeks ago, I, I was pretty ambivalent. And now I'm out and out optimistic. I think that this judicial reform is going to fail. I don't think that the coalition can pull it together. And uh, I think that we will win at least on this judicial reform issue. Yes, he also did link that to the occupation. Yeah, but he was not as optimistic about ending the occupation. <laughs> no, he wasn't, but he did link it. Yes. I think that is uh, important for us. Very. It's not just, okay, judicial reform for starters or judicial coup for starters, but how does that affect the, the occupation? And it does, from home demolitions uh, to many, many other things, to settlements. Mm -hmm. uh, you have segued yourself very nicely into telling people about the demonstration you attended. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, in Tel Aviv, uh, I attended a demonstration. It was, there's the main core, and then there are many where there are speakers, and then there are many other streets uh, radiating from that core. So you can find, and there are people walking around there, talking, um, there was some music. Uh, so I found it, okay, this was a while ago, but still the demonstrations had been going on for a while. I found it, uh, I've been to a lot of demonstrations in my life, and I found it uh, rather festive, you know, relaxed, I would say. Um, there were, you know, people with kids. There were, you know, it was all ages. Um, I know there was an issue with Palestinian flags, and I, I found a cluster of Palestinian flags, and I asked about that, and they said, these are Israelis. And there was a woman wearing a sign saying, Palestinian lives matter. 
Then um, conveniently, the this streets this street extends to some of the main streets in Tel Aviv with cafes and restaurants. So they were doing a brisk business, I assume, and people were sitting there, you know, outdoors uh, with uh, flags draped over the, the back of their chairs. Of course, you know, they all wave flags, Israeli flags. So uh, to me, that was a, a very good sign. And I was so glad that, that I could be there. Um, there's a group in North America called Unacceptable, UN, right. capital X, acceptable. And in Toronto, they've been having weekly demonstrations on Sunday at four o'clock at Nathan Phillips Square. I don't know what they're doing in Montreal, but uh, anybody who's in Toronto is welcome to join the demonstration. And they have, uh, it's not quite as big as Tel Aviv, but it's really enthusiastic. And a lot of Israelis, I would say mostly Israelis, wouldn't you? Yes, oh, it's, all, it's very much. In fact, for the first couple of months, they were doing it all in Hebrew, and then they realized that they weren't attracting as many people as they could, so they switched to English. Um, now, Jacqueline's given you the more optimistic demonstration. We also attempted to go to a demonstration, but didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I mentioned, the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood was maybe 100 meters from, from our hotel. And so we planned to go to the Friday night demonstration that uh, Shalom Ashab <coughs> organizes to support the residents who were being evicted. Unfortunately, as we got out of the bus, we began to smell skunk water, terrible smell. And little wafts of tear gas and we saw people coming out bleeding and uh, our guide Hadar of Americans for Peace Now said stop nobody's going get back on the bus and we rode 50 or so meters to the hotel uh, but we were not able to participate in that demonstration. Are there any uh, more questions? Put them in the chat or I don't I think it's worth describing a checkpoint while people are typing in questions would you like okay. to talk about our experience with the checkpoints well the main checkpoint the where we were stopped was coming back from Ramallah and there were you know bewildered teenagers with uh, machine guns not quite knowing what to do with us. Uh, they got on the bus, asked some questions, and it was a while, uh, walked around the bus. We didn't have to get out. And, um, and that, that was it. It was, it was intimidating. But of course, we're North Americans, so. And the Palestinian people who were involved didn't go on these buses because they knew that there would be an extra couple of hours of harassment right if they accompanied us right right so uh people so things were set up for us so like ramallah uh people were expecting us um Everybody i just got a note from elizabeth block who said that the uh chat is disabled oh no i don't know how that happened, but that would make it more difficult to ask questions. If okay, how about the Q&A? That's not disabled, I don't think. Uh, Lisa, do you know? Lisa's um, hiding here. Uh, no, the, 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 the chat is, is for hosts and panelists. The Q&A is for guests, but I can open the chat. That's no problem. Would you mind? Yeah, go ahead, it's open. Okay. Um, so Gabriella writes, uh, did the trip change your views about anything? What were one or two main ideas you came away with? Well, I'll tell you what I came away with. Um, there are measures that can be taken immediately, like stopping demolitions, like stopping the land grab unless these kinds of uh, good faith measures are taken, how do you expect 
the Palestinians to have any hope. And I'd like hope, to add, there happens. are more measures that could be taken, and I yes. completely agree with what Jacqueline said. But one of the most important is provide municipal services for East Jerusalemites. Yes. Just yes. garbage collection, sewage, police. Give them, and, give them a break. Right. And in the West Bank, um, well, that was an education in what a place looks like without municipal services. Things that you take for granted, like crosswalks, you know, sidewalks, proper sidewalks, um, you don't see them there. So again, all of that is, is very kind of, is politically corrosive. Uh, another thing that would really be a great contribution, and I don't think I, I I've known this, for 30 years, but I don't think I realized how important it was, is just Israel follow Israeli law. A lot of the settlements, which are the biggest problem, are illegal. These right. are people who come and set up a, tra a trailer, and then more people set up more trailers, and they start building illegal settlements. And instead of them being cleared away, uh, the government says, okay, we'll legalize them. There's too many people there to throw out. And so the settlements expand and the Palestinians are furious as they can see more and more settlements and no legal recourse, even though they're illegal. Um, and it's an extremely frustrating thing and, and we felt it. One thing that um, I noted in the Israeli newspapers, which you will not see in the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Good American newspapers. Uh, after the pogrom, the army swooped in and arrested eight people. Uh, and then seven of them were released right away and put on, and the army came back and put them on administrative detention, which meant home or house arrest. And the politicians on the right wing, Ben Gavar, uh, Schmutrich, uh, Cohen have been furious about these people being arrested for no good reason. All they did was kill somebody. Um, Saul asks, what happened uh, with the evictions at Sheikh Jarrah? I believe there was a kind of stay uh, because of all the publicity. The, it got worldwide publicity. So it is it is up in the air right now. And of course, a lot depends again on whether or not this judicial coup goes through. Bob, do you wanna take the next one? Yeah, except um, fortunately, even though I didn't know the answer, uh, one of our guests did. Elizabeth Block asked, don't the people in East Jerusalem pay taxes that support the services they don't get? And uh, Dorcas Gordon answered, no services yet. The East Jerusalemites pay full taxes to access these services. <laughs> uh, then the, another question, does administrative detention for Jews mean house arrest? It doesn't for Palestinians. Well, darn right. That's clear as bell. What is, I don't think there is administrative detention for Jews. I think oh, no, those are the, those seven people are under administrative detention right oh, now who really? are involved in the pogrom. Uh, That's unusual seven, for... Seven out of, yeah, but they killed somebody. They were burning houses. They were burning cars. They were stoning people. And more than that, it got worldwide attention. Yeah. They've done things like that before, but it was, it, it was under the radar. Okay, any other questions? I think that we're pretty close to our end time. I think so too. And I really appreciated the opportunity to discuss this. It was a fascinating trip. I encourage anybody who gets a chance to watch the Americans for Peace Now website and look for another one of these tours. 
You don't have to be knowledgeable to go. You will learn an immense amount. And, and it's fun. Yeah. You eat However, well. if you really want to see Israel and be a tourist and go to the beach in Tel Aviv, uh, you should extend your stay because um, it was jam-packed for us. <laughs> and we had almost no free time. It was get on the bus at eight o'clock in the morning or else go to a meeting at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And uh, back to the hotel sometime around 9.30. Right, right. The thing is, the people we met were so fascinating that uh, it kept us awake. Yeah. Plus some really good meals. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so we- Thank you for coming. And I just want to remind, as uh, we said at the beginning, Canadian Friends of Peace Now is a nonprofit charitable organization that sends money to Israel, to, to sends money to Shalom Ashav in Israel to support projects and activities in support of peace and a two-state solution. So anybody who feels inclined to write us a check, uh, we would be very pleased to receive it. Um, and uh, I promise it'll be well spent. Okay. Well, we're going to say good night and uh, until our next Zoom Zoominar. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know what? I can't remember which one's the next one. We have one coming up very soon. And uh, do you remember? Yeah, what Bill, do you want to put it in the chat or the? Uh... I don't know. Let's leave it. Okay. Let's just uh... check our website. Yeah. And okay. this. Okay.